Good evening and welcome to our evening with Emma Donahue. So pleased to welcome Emma Donahue to here this evening. This is part of our annual All Pikes Peak Reads event. Each year we choose a novel and do a variety of programming and then the highlight is having the authors visit. And this year things are a little bit different and then we're hosting virtual authors but we're so excited that our adult selection was The Pull of the Stars by Emma Donahue. And so we're excited to have her here with us this evening. In November, we'll be hosting our teen and children authors. Lindsay Lackey, author of All the Impossible Things, will be here virtually on November 10th. And Brenda Woods will be joining us virtually on November 12th, author of our children's selection, The Unsung Hero of Birdsong USA. For this evening, we're delighted to welcome Emma Donahue. Emma was born in Dublin. She's the youngest of eight children. She lived in Dublin until college. She graduated from University College Dublin with a BA in English and French. She moved to England where she received her PhD from the University of Cambridge. And she is now settled in London, Ontario where she lives with her partner and son and daughter. Emma is the author of several novels. She's also a playwright and screenwriter. Her novel Room was shortlisted for the Man Booker and Orange Prizes and has sold over 2 million copies. She adapted it into her first feature film, directed by Lenny Abramson, which was nominated for four Academy Awards for Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Director, Best Picture, and Best Actress. And her latest novel is The Pull of the Stars, which we're delighted to have her here with us this evening. She'll start by sharing a short reading from The Pull of the Stars, then we'll have a conversation and we'll end by taking questions from the audience. So please feel free to enter your questions in chat. Wasn't expecting any, she said. She was the pale freckle dusted type of red haired, light blue eyes, brows almost invisible. Something childlike about this bridey Sweeney's translucent ears. The one on the left angled a little forward as if eager to catch every word. Thin coat, broken down shoes, on an ordinary day, my matron would never have let her in the door. Well, I said, I could do with a runner to fetch and carry, so I'm glad you're here. This is Mrs. Garrett and Mrs. Noonan. Good day, ladies, Bridie Sweeney said with a bob. I took a folded apron down from the press for her. This volunteer was a scrap and she looked even thinner once she'd taken her coat off. She had to wrap the apron's ties around her waist twice. With frank curiosity, she watched Eta Noonan rocking on the little chair by her cot, wheezing a song, and she remarked, I've never been in a hospital. By the way, Miss Sweeney, I said, I assume you're immune. The young woman didn't seem to know the word. To the flu, I said, immune to this grief, since you've walked into a fever ward without a mask on. Oh, I've had the grief, she assured me. No, but this year's one, the bad one, I specified. Got over it ages ago, she said. Now, what do you want doing, Nurse Power? Frankly, it was a relief to be asked that. I said, let's start by making up Mrs. Noonan's bed. I checked the base layers were all smooth, the wire spring mattress in its canvas cover sitting just so on the boards, the hair mattress in its cotton one on top, a ruddy tan waterproof Macintosh base fitted tight, then an under blanket, then a sheet. Aromatic with whiskey fumes, I eat a Noonan tried to climb on. Just another minute, Mrs. Noonan, I said as I blocked her gently with my arm. I got a fresh draw sheet, upper and lower sheets, and blankets from the bedding cupboard. And I said to Bridie Sweeney, we pull every layer smooth and crisp, see, so there will be no wrinkles to hurt Mrs. Noonan's skin. Bridie Sweeney nodded, taking it all in. As I helped Eta Noonan into bed, she heaved a breath and cried, such malarkey. The newcomer asked, what is? I shook my head at her. Her face froze. Sorry, said Bridie Sweeney, am I not allowed to talk to them? I smiled, I said, I only meant don't worry if Mrs. Noonan makes odd remarks. I tapped my scalp and said, high, a high temperature can rattle the pot. I wound one shawl around the sick woman's shoulders and draped another over the back of her head to keep drafts off. Eta Noonan squatted at the air with her sipping cup of hot whiskey. Awful yahoos left my Delphin smithereens. Did they now? said Bridie Sweeney pleasantly, fixing the pillows. The young woman had a very pleasant bedside manner, I decided. That couldn't be taught. I pushed the ball of soiled bedding down into the laundry bucket and I jer jerked my thumb towards the passage. This goes down the chute, I said. The one marks laundry, not incinerator. Bridie Sweeney hurried out with the bucket. 
Delia Garrett spoke up from her bed and asked, did that girl just walk in here off the street? Well, I said, if Sister Luke recommended her, a snort from Delia Garrett. We're so short staffed, Mrs. Garrett, I would gladly accept any help. She muttered into her magazine. I never said you shouldn't. When Bridie Sweeney came back in, I took her through the distinctions between various gauze dressings, squares, balls, six foot strips and tins, flax toe swabs, single use cloths, ligatures, cat gut. She said, the actual guts of cats. Uh, sheep, actually, I said, I don't know why it's called cat gut. Bridie Sweeney beamed around her. So these ladies are here for you to cure their grief. I let out a breath. I only wish I knew how to do that, Miss Sweeney, but there's no cure for the flu as such. The thing has to run its course. For how long? Days, I said, or weeks. I was trying not to think of those it killed with little warning in the street or down on their own floorboards. Or it can linger for months, I admitted. To be perfectly frank, it's a toss-up. All we can do here is keep them warm and rested, fed and watered, so they can put whatever force they have into beating this flu. My young helper seemed fascinated. She said under her breath, why is Mrs. Noon in that color? Ah, here was something simple I could teach. I told her they go dark in the face if they're not getting quite enough oxygen into their blood. It's called cyanosis after cyan, the shade of blue, you know? I wasn't sure she did know. She's not blue though, said Bridie Sweeney. She's more like scarlet. Well, I said, it begins with a light red you might mistake for a healthy flush. If the patient gets worse, her cheeks go rather mahogany. I thought of the turning of the leaves in autumn. In a more severe case, I said, the brown might be followed by lavender in the lips. Cheeks and ears and even fingertips can become quite blue as the patient is starved of air. Horrible, said Bridie Sweeney. I remembered to turn to Mrs. Garrett and say, don't worry, Mrs. Garrett, you're not in the least cyanotic. You have a very mild case. She gave a little shudder at the idea. Bridie Sweeney asked, is blue as far as it goes? Red, then brown, then blue. I shook my head and I said, I've seen it darken sometimes to violet, purple, until they're quite black in the face. So it's like a secret code, said Bridie Sweeney with pleasure. Red to brown to blue to black. I'm going to leave that there. That's wonderful. Thank you. So um, I know you touched on this right uh, as you before you started the reading, but you know you did start writing this book in 2018, and then um, finished. I know in, in in the spring. So how do you think? And the book resonates so well right now. I think because of what we're going through. But how do you think it might have been different had either we not been going some, through something similar, or or how, what do you think of? Um, of kind of the timing of it it's just it, it's an interesting it. what if isn't it amy and um, yeah i delivered you know the very very final draft after full rewrites i delivered it on the 3rd of march and then it wasn't scheduled to be published until next year because frankly we were trying to avoid publishing during the u.s election season which can be a hard time to promote fiction because everyone's so distracted by the real you know so um i thought oh i've got a year now before publication and then i only then did I really begin to notice the headlines about COVID. And um, I, had a, I, I was preoccupied by a play and the stage production of Room was in rehearsals and just about to open and it was cancelled on opening night um, uh, on the 13th of March. So I was all distracted by that. And then suddenly my publishers rang me up and said, you know, it's about a virus. Uh, we should publish it this summer. And I honestly was flabbergasted. I hadn't thought of any relevance to today. I just thought of them as two separate historical moments. But of course, I think they were quite right to because frankly, by next year, people may be entirely sick of, of uh, virus stories. <laughs> but no, in, in a deeper sense, I'm glad they decided to do it too. I, I wouldn't have thought to suggest it because um, I frankly didn't know they could do it that fast. You know, they just jumped into action and, and the, copy, the copy editor, I'm really lucky I have a copy editor at Little Brown who is an emergency room doctor as well, half her time. So she was literally going between COVID patients and my book. And I also hired a midwife who was in quarantine um, because of exposure during, you know, looking after women in childbirth. And she worked on my book too. So, you know, we had an intense few weeks, but we didn't add anything at all about COVID. The only change I made um, was that in, in writing the novel, I had, you know, the correct word for what was happening in 1918 was pandemic. It was everywhere in the world. It 
it killed between four and 6% of the entire human population. But I, pandemic seemed a really sciencey, jargony word, you know, so I had carefully used the word epidemic. Um, but suddenly by the end of March, pandemic was a routine word. So the only change I remember making was to say, okay, I'm gonna let myself say pandemic. Um, but nothing else changed because there were already so many similarities. So to answer your question, I'm not sure how it would have been received. I mean, my publishers had been perfectly excited to buy it in 2019, so clearly they thought it would work. But there's always a danger with historical fiction that it's seen as just a kind of a, a cozy little thing with no relevance to today, when in fact, every writer puts their, their feelings about their own culture and their own moment into their book, even if it's set in you know, 2000 BC. Um, and also women's history in particular, sometimes uh, there's a danger that people read it as, again, a little sort of small. And you might say I courted this with this novel by saying the whole thing in a tiny maternity ward. You know, so one thing I really like is that the COVID, the COVID context has made people take this novel very seriously. And um, for the bigger questions it raises about things like, you know, war versus disease and um, you know, how, how pandemics uh, strike the poor harder. So questions like this have become kind of visible because it's been published this year where, when it might perhaps have, you know, been read just as a kind of a, you know, historical piece before. Um, but on the other hand, I feel really sheepish that the book has done so well this year because <laughs> I had no intention of profiting from a pandemic. You know, the entire thing was written beforehand. So it's been a strange experience. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really amazing. And I think even just those you know, reading the book and seeing just some of the signs that were, you know, on the streets and things like that and, and comparing to what things are like today. So I think it's fascinating to think about, well, if I was reading this, not going through anything similar, you know, what that would that be like? So yeah, so. yeah. And you mentioned the government propaganda. I've got these sort of government notices all the way to the book and I made them up, but they're very much inspired by, by posters of the day and by information from lots of different governments. I remember getting some from Brazil and Argentina, as well as some of those classic um, US posters warning you about, you know, coughs and sneezes cause diseases. They often use rhyme, you know, to make them catchy. And I was trying to capture in, in the, the messages from politicians, that kind of weird mixture of tones, you know, one minute they're being all stern and making it sound like your own, you know, you're running your own risks, you know, um, and that you're not to give way to, to disease or to let your system get worn down. So there's lots of blaming the victim or saying things like, seek out fresh air and sunshine. I'm thinking, you're living in an incredibly damp Dublin slum in November 1918. Where are you meant to get all this fresh air and sunshine, you know? And then the next minute, government signs would turn kind of glibly reassuring and would say things like, we have the situation well in hand, you know, which is just designed to stop people from panicking, but it doesn't actually help. So I've been very um, interested to see, you know, a similar kind of tonal uncertainty in, in many politician statements this year, you know, like, um, you know, like, oh, we must protect the economy, keep everything ticking over. Um, I suppose politicians always have kind of mixed loyalties, don't they? You know, that they can never simply afford to just speak like scientists do. You know, they always sort of have, have to have one, one eye on, you know, how they can spin it. Right, yeah, it was, it's really was just fascinating. Well, you touched on this just briefly, but, Right, you know, many of the patients portrayed in the book are experiencing poverty and malnutrition. And we've also seen, certainly with COVID-19, that it disproportionately has impacted marginalized pe people. So did you deliberately want to write about poverty as it relates to health and health care? Was that? Yeah, I think, I, th I think my first key decision was to set it in a maternity ward because that kept the story really focused on women. And because the pandemic was happening during World War I, we're so familiar with those stories of the men in the trenches and their, their camaraderie and bonding. And I thought, actually, if you set it in a maternity ward with you know, female nurses and midwives and even a woman doctor and women going through labor, it's going to be an astonishingly intense bonding there too. But then the second key decision I made was to set it in a sort of inner city hospital that served the people of the Dublin slums rather than in a kind of you know, nice, nice clinic in the suburbs. I just thought that would be a more interesting range of characters. And I suppose, again, something I hadn't thought of in terms of contemporary relevance was, yeah, the way, the way diseases are not levelers. They, they typically, part, I think gout is the only disease I can think of that the rich are particularly susceptible to throughout history. But um, you know, most things hit those who we, as a society, uh, people who have been, um, we have agreed to sort of keep down through, through, you know, um, through race, through class, through poverty, through deprivation. Um, so I, it's funny, you know, in, in, in Ireland, we're talking about a pretty much 
all white country, but the class in, in those days, not now, but the class distinctions um, work in that very uh, sort of, you know, segregated society way. Um, and so the patients coming in um, from, from the slums, um, Julia Power in a way gets politicized by looking at them and thinking, oh my God, you were sick and weakened long before this illness took you, you know? Like, especially these mothers who were having so many children because Irish culture was particularly pro-natalist, you know? So um, the Catholic church and, and working class culture, it, and it was all pushing these women to have so many children. And sometimes like that patient, Ita Noonan comes in already with one leg swollen up from the last time she gave birth. So talk about pre-existing conditions. So in a way I'm presenting um, a, a scenario in which, you know, the flu is the least of their worries. They're already so worn down. Um, and so, you know, their, their bodies are kind of um, like, um, you know, a, a diagram of deprivation. So, so yeah, the, the book ended up being sort of more political than I, than I thought it would be just because of that decision to set it among the, um, yeah, the inner city poor. Dragon 12, thank you. Well, and even, you know, um, the book itself, you know, is so descriptive and the depiction of birth are sometimes graphic, you know, um, and, and I know I certainly heard that comment of just, you know, the descriptions are just so, so real. And at one point in the novel, um, Going kind of one of the caretakers there and Julia argue about women's rights and he comments that women haven't paid the blood tax. And I was interesting, how, how would you say your graphic depictions of labor were meant to maybe counter that argument? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's funny, you know, that the month I was writing about um, October into November, 1918, they had just brought in the vote for women over 30 and Julia's just turning 30 or, or rather I decided to make her turn 30 that month because I thought it would be interesting if she's just about to get a vote for the first time. But one of the arguments against that, because um, you could all, you should always brainstorm the arguments on both sides of the argument as it were, you know, you, you want a conversation to be lively, you don't want just to set somebody up as wrong. So, so someone like Groin the Orderly, who's, who's freshly back from, from the trenches, you know, he would say that, you know, men in those days because they went to war they were always liable to be conscripted to go to war they fundamentally had had skin in the game politically they they were literally defending their king they were defending their country and he saw women as kind of secondary citizens who really only had a place in the society in that they were connected to a man but they weren't actually out there in the trenches you know claiming their citizenship by playing what paying what he calls the blood tax and i thought this was a fascinating term the blood tax because you know it immediately struck me um that all these women are shedding blood to bring people like him into the world you know so so yeah julia looks around her and says this is where every nation draws its breath women pay the blood tax every day and yes it's not the same thing but they're they're both invaluable contributions um, so, so yeah, it's, it, it's funny what a rich setting a maternity ward proved to be, especially at a time when, in a way, um, you know, men had this very sort of clear role as, you know, the heroes out there dying in the trenches. Um, but in fact, World War I really kind of shook up gender roles and a lot of women moved into men's jobs while the men were gone. So, so it was a very strange time gender wise. And I thought it would be very interesting to have Julia glimpse the fact that really this tiny little room is a site of as much heroism and intense danger um, as, as, as the war fields. And similarly, some women want these babies and some have these babies thrust upon them. You know, there are, there are sort of, you know, um, women who enlist in this, in this <laughs> bloody war and women who are very much conscripted into it. Oh, thank you. Well, and I also found it really interesting that really the two characters spending the most time there in the maternity ward taking care of the, the mothers, soon to be mothers, were essentially motherless themselves. You know, Bridie had, was an orphan and Julia lost, I mean, well, she never knew her mother. And I, I wondered if this was intentional and if so, could you share why? That, that's funny. I, probably what I thought of as I was going into it was that I wanted Julia to, to be a single woman who doesn't have any children because it's interesting that often midwives have been, um, uh, you know, not had children themselves, but have really dedicated their lives to helping women who do. So that's, that's an interesting kind of pairing there, you know, the midwife and the mother. Um, and then I thought I wanted Julia to have a especially strong motivation to save these women, especially from um, that, that fever that women often died of um, a few days after labor. 
And unfortunately, when birth got medicalized and was brought into hospitals and doctors went around helping, often they spread germs from woman to woman. So there was a bad phase in which hospitals actually made women more likely to die after childbirth because of, because of this fever. So I wanted to give Julia a particularly zealous vocation. And I thought, well, if her own mother died um, that way after, after the birth of her last child. Um, and Bridie is the only character who, that I've ever um, been inspired by a government report. Um, you know, like many parts of the world, Ireland has been doing a huge amount of kind of self-examination about its institutions, its residential institutions, which when I was growing up, they were always seen as just wonderful, like, oh, isn't it marvelous that the nuns will take you in if you're an orphan, this kind of thing. And I now know better. I know that many of the children taken into these institutions had parents, just parents who lost custody of them. And um, there was a whole network of, of you know, in reform schools, so-called industrial schools, Magdalene houses for girls who were seen as being, you know, in danger of becoming fallen, fallen women, mother and baby homes. I mean, right this week, Ireland is, is having a bitter battle about whether to seal up the records of its investigation into those mother and baby homes. And they're basically passing a law to seal the records. And a lot of people are deeply distressed that, you know, we had a chance to actually let the truth be aired, but no, it's been sealed up again. And anyway, Bridie, Bridie's background is inspired by the, um, the previous report the Irish government commissioned into um, the, basically the orphanages. And um, I, I read very, very detailed testimonies by people who'd been through these institutions. And I thought it would be very interesting if Bridie came out of a situation like that. So she has no reason to be to have anything to give, you know, she, she should be bitter and twisted really, this young woman. Um, and yet I wanted her to have kind of natural reserves of generosity and intelligence and, and, and qualities that had never been used before because nobody had ever given her useful work to do. You know, she's just been a skivvy. So I was wondering, I suppose, how fast someone like that could bloom if they found themselves in a setting, even in this volunteer job, where they're being taught, you know, medical things suddenly and, and things about hygiene and things about human psychology and things about birth. And I wanted to see sort of how much bride you could learn in three days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's really amazing. And um, really you show kind of over the course of the book, almost seem like almost every possible outcome of a pregnant mother, you know, coming to the hospital during this time. And we, so we see almost every possible outcome and so why did you choose to show kind of that full range of life and death? Sure. Well, you know, childbirth is not really very often written about, or sometimes a book might have one key birth, but it's not usually looked at collectively. And what's amazing about childbirth from a narrative point of view is that it's not an illness. It's not necessarily a sad thing, and it's not necessarily a wonderful thing either. It can, it can be either of those things, and it can change course halfway. I mean, many a woman has sailed into what feels like a great birth and then suddenly or afterwards it all goes horribly wrong and similarly you can have I, I have friends who who tell stories of you know three days of horror and misery and then suddenly babies out happy ending all as well so it's wonderfully unpredictable and I thought if you set the the childbirth story for each of these women against her flu story you know which is not at all the same thing it would be just wonderfully unpredictable and so I wanted to show childbirth in all its variety, I suppose, and, and sort of get the, the sweet moments out of it, you know, and get the, the horrifying ones too. And, and basically the flu made it all way more high risk. Um, so, you know, you know, one equivalent in COVID would be a lot of people think of, you know, long-term care homes as just a kind of a, you know, a quiet ending to a life. You know, the idea is like, oh yes, our older people are being cared for, you know? But now, of course, because of COVID, we've started to think of long-term care homes as like this site of terror and possible isolation and families parted from their loved ones and yet the heroism of those looking after them. So we've started to actually pay attention to that space of the long-term care home and see its, its dramas um, in the context of the pandemic. And I suppose similarly with the birth room, I wanted to take birth and, and sort of show what a, you know, startling and, and shocking drama it can be um, for good or bad. Um, I just don't think it's often given enough respect <laughs> as a, you know, as a, as a sort of incredibly unpredictable and, and, and yes, yeah, sometimes thrilling process. I mean, I, 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 the two times I gave birth, I found it just the most fascinating experience I ever had, really. You know, you, know, you go in as one person and you come out as two. You know, it's an it's a, you know, existential puzzle. Right. Yeah, it's truly amazing. And so I just thought that was so interesting. And, and really, just 
this question is a little more about kind of how you set the book up because it really is intense and, and descriptive as we talked about and very much a page turner, but it's also fairly unique in that I think there's only four chapters, you know, there's, um, but it's a full length novel. And then also as the characters are speaking, there's really no quotation marks anyway. So I wonder why you chose that those different I love um, getting the literary questions Amy. It's such <laughs> pleasure because so often you know so often the media doesn't know what to do with fiction it basically wishes it was non-fiction and it's so it it asks you about all the real stuff and then it asks you is any of it autobiographical and you know it's like let's squeeze it and find the pebbles of fact so yeah I love these questions yeah so the the chapter lengths it's funny I remember when I was breastfeeding our second child, I was really grateful for books with tiny chapters because they're so much easier. So I remember reading the Da Vinci Code and it was a, you know, a chapter break every three pages. <laughs> I could readjust the baby. So that was ideal. Um, and a book with no chapter breaks at all would be a bit daunting because you wouldn't know like how much do I read before going to bed, that kind of thing. So in this case, in a way, I wanted the chapters to feel like long shifts in the hospital. You know, I, I didn't want to give the kind of easy relief of, oh, we'll have a little chapter break here. You know, I wanted the reader to feel like, oh my God, we were just having a nice conversation and now suddenly somebody's hemorrhaging. Oh, what's happening? Somebody new is coming in. So I wanted them to feel um, almost gruelingly, you know, busy for long stretches of time. And also quite early on, I'd come across this, what Bridie describes as like the, you know, the, the color code of the different colors. And so I decided to call my chapters after that um, face change of, um, you know, uh, red, brown, blue, and black. Um, the quotation marks was something I really, really brooded and fretted over. It's funny, you know, writers often will spend so much time fretting over something that readers may not necessarily notice. For instance, whether a book should be in the first person or the third person or the present tense or the past tense. You know, sometimes I lie there at night going back and forth in my decision making about these very literary points. So with the quotation marks, and um, usually in my fiction, I use perfectly normal quotation marks. And they make the reader's job easier, but they also could be said to give an almost sort of false reassurance that at any point on the page, you know which words are spoken and which are just thought. And there's a kind of a slightly sedate quality to that. And with this novel, I wanted something trippier. You know, I, I want Julia to be exhausted and mad busy and people coming at her from all sides and, you know, people singing things and, and you know, little bits of sort of mad speech, like the, the delirious patient Ida Noonan is called coming out with random remarks. So I wanted the whole thing to be slightly blurred. Um, I didn't want the reader to be completely bewildered, so I try and make it clear, you know, I put in plenty of she said or he said. Um, but I did want to capture that kind of almost, you know, impressionistic quality of, you know, there are words floating around and you have to pay slight attention to work out, has someone actually said them or have you just, just thought them? And some writers I admire very much, like say Roddy Doyle or Ali Smith, they, they have a firm policy of no quotation marks. They really like you to have to just work ever so slightly harder to, to, to realize there's a word said or, 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 or just thought. So, you know, I, I think I probably would just do it just for this book and no other. I mean, with every book, I, I ask myself all these questions all over again. I try and really suit the style to the particular story I'm telling rather than having any kind of, you know, permanent Emma Donoghue style. You know? So sometimes I'll meet someone who, who will, during the conversation, realize that they've read three or four of my books, but they had no idea it was all the same person. I think that's great because it means they've really been absorbed in the stories, you know, not me. That's wonderful. And it really worked because it really definitely made it much more just intense and patient. And I was exhausted, like Julia was, you know, when I was reading that. Um, well, I know we have um, a number of questions coming in from the audience. So I have just one more here and then we'll kind of um, start taking questions here from the audience. So again, um, if, you, if any of you have questions, please go ahead and enter those in the chat. Um, so there was a particular scene um, when um, Dr. Lynn was performing the autopsy on Ida Noonan and Julia and her have a fairly civil but very heated political discussion. And I know you've talked a little bit about the politics that kind of were woven throughout, but um, what do you think we should kind of take away that this discussion was happening kind of during the autopsy, you know, is this very kind of fierce conversation about politics and, and the nature of society, but they're also doing this fairly, you know, almost like gruesome task as well. And so I, I, I wondered kind of maybe what your intent was. There. That's a good question. I think there's two reasons that that conversation happens there. By the way, in the first draft, um, I had intended all these people to be fictional, you know, because the pandemic seemed real enough without my also having real 
individuals to write about. But when I was trying to gather background information on Irish doctors of the time, I came across Kathleen Lynn, who was, you know, uh, she was the chief medical officer for Sh Sinn Féin. She was involved in the revolutionary movement, the Easter Rising. Um, she was, you know, a fully committed, um, really paramilitary revolutionary, as well as a marvellous doctor with a specialty in midwifery. So I thought, OK, I have to use her. But I, I thought I'll keep her, I'll, I'll put her under a fictional name and I'll keep her politics out of it. Um, but I couldn't, you know, even even the few things she said, my agents were like, what's going on there? Tell us about the revolution, you know, and especially for for non-Irish readers, they said, no, you have to explain that during those few years, Ireland was basically shifting from being a fairly loyal subject country of the British Empire to to becoming a free state by by the end of the decade. So a lot of people went from Julia's point of view of like, everything's fine. We are subjects of the king right through to Dr. Kathleen Lynn's view of we need to run our own country. And I thought, first of all, it's, it's actually, if you're writing a medical drama, I notice on, on things like Grey's Anatomy, which I'm a huge fan of, um, they, they carefully build in enough conversations in the corridors. They know that these doctors have almost no time off, so they can't give them some long leisurely chat in the canteen, but they can have a little walk and talk um, actually, same with West Wing. That show always showed them it's very busy with politics, but they would have time to have little free conversations in the corridor. So literally, if you're trying to find a time for two of your medical staff to have a conversation, they can't really be doing it while they're meeting the needs of the patient. So the autopsy is actually a relatively <laughs> calm moment um, to have a quite a detailed conversation. But also, I really wanted the politics in a way to be suggested by the facts of the woman's body. Um, for instance, I wanted Dr. Lynn to, to bring up her revolutionary politics, not in some kind of abstract, I'm now going to talk about my political commitments way. And she's certainly not showing off and saying, I was in the, the Easter Rising of 1916. It comes up naturally. And how it comes up is that she's looking at the lungs of this flu patient, which are just gummed up, you know, and she's saying, oh, this is like my comrade who died after being force fed, you know. So, so in a way, she's, she's drawing a very strong political conclusion from the fact of this woman's body. And what she's basically saying is that Ireland is so mismanaged and the Dublin slums are the worst this size, this side of Bombay, as they would have called Mumbai at the time. And uh, basically we need to run our own country because it's in a terrible state. So her politics are not abstract. Um, and again, I thought if she and Julia are working together on something, trying to understand why exactly this woman died, how the flu operated on this woman's body. Um, in a way, that, that provides a very kind of concrete, um, real basis for all their political discussions. Again, they talk about, say, poverty. You know, you can literally read it on the body of this woman that they're doing an autopsy on. You know, you can see where she had too many children, she wasn't fed enough. Um, so I thought, I thought that, that autopsy setting... Um, would give just such a kind of concrete anchor to these conversations. You never want things to get just too abstract because then it doesn't feel like fiction. It feels like you're, you're seizing an excuse to lecture your readers. You know, so, so just as I, I like to find really concrete images for something like the pandemic, you know, the, the color, the face changing color. Again, I wanted the politics to be absolutely rooted in, you know, a particular, a particular body of a particular woman who we know about and care about. That was, it was just really compelling. So thank you. Well, we do have quite a few questions. So if it's okay, I'm going to go ahead and shift gears sure, and sure. start taking questions from, from our audience. So um, the first one here is, um, hi, Emma, I love your work. How, is, how has your writing process changed over the years, especially in light of your commercial success? That's a great question. And um, you might expect that, that having a big bestseller, which I only had with my seventh novel, Room, that that would change somebody's writing. But actually, no, I would say a much bigger change was a couple of years earlier. And um, I would say a lot of my novels were quite fact inspired. And sometimes this can make a novel very baggy and shapeless. Um, I, I'm thinking of one novel I wrote called Life Mask about the rich in the 1790s. And I was using so many real letters and real dinner parties and real incidents that, you know, the novel has plenty of charms, but it's very sort of loose. Um, and so in 2008, I was writing a novel about a divorce case, a Victorian divorce case called The Sealed Letter. And I remember thinking, I'm not naturally good at plot and I'm going to waste this material if I don't make the plot kind of lean and mean and suspenseful, you know? So I thought for the first time, I'm actually going to try writing down what happens in all the chapters in advance and seeing, can I improve it? 
And it made a radical difference because I looked at what happened and I was like, you know what, we can cut all that, we can move all that, hide that bit from the reader there. So I basically became much more of a planner um, around, around the mid 90s. And I would say that I have a sort of certain natural talent for dialogue. It's not all great dialogue, but I'm certainly, you know, I produce the stuff, you know, it just <laughs> comes out of me. Be being one of a household of 10 people, you know, we were always like, I have something to say, you know, <laughs> made you into a talker. But I'm not naturally good at plot at all. So I've become a much more sort of, you know, almost cold-blooded plotter because I can, I can almost always find ways to, to pull the strings tighter, you know, and, and, and make the whole thing a stronger shape if I do this kind of planning in advance. So that's, that's the big literary change I can think of. The other big change, I suppose, and um, my kids would say it's entirely due to them in that I wrote about quite a few things before they were born, but since they came along, uh, our son is 16 now, um, there have been children in everything I write. And I'm fascinated in particular by relations between adults and children, not even necessarily parents, um, but, but adults who find their lives have to alter in response to the, the needs and vulnerability of children. I seem to be fascinated by that one. Clearly, I've never got over the shock of having our first kid and finding like, I'm not allowed to go to bed now. <laughs> I have to stay awake because he's awake. <laughs> So, so yeah, those have been two big changes. You know, to be honest, the success of Room has been great and it's got me lots more readers, but it didn't change my writing. Great, thank you. So our next question is, how much of your fictional characters are based on actual people you know? Good question. Um, sometimes I do use uh, material from, from friends, um, sometimes from my own life. I wrote one novel called Landing about an Irish woman who moves to Canada, like I did but I decided to make her a very different person. So she's a flight attendant and she's very beautiful and she's biracial. So, you know, in lots of ways she wasn't me, but I put her through the same kind of, you know, encounter with Canadian bureaucracy and the whole emigration and long distance relationship process. Um, I sometimes ask friends, literally, can I, can I borrow an incident? Um, I've occasionally used material from my own life and just disguised it by making the narrator a man. Um, I find if you swap the gender, Hardly anyone, you know, sees it as you. Um, and then in my in my historical fiction, many of them have been real people. Or occasionally, even if they're not named individuals, I will be drawing on a lot of real cases. So say my novel in 2016 called The Wonder, which is about a, a girl claiming to live on air, you know, in 19th century Ireland. Um, she's not a real one, but there were about 50 of these cases over the centuries of girls claiming to live without food. So I'm, I'm very often inspired by the historical record. And in particular, you know, it's almost the less that there's there in the record, the more it puzzles and intrigues me. You know, I just, I, I feel I have to try and supplement, you know, fill those gaps with fiction. That's the kind of thing, if you were a historian, you would want to find more reliable sources. But, but if you're a fiction writer, you're going, ooh, you know, all we know, say my first historical novel, Slammerton, Really, all we know about that young woman called Mary Saunders is that she picked up a meat cleaver and killed somebody with it in 1763. And in a way, I, I wrote the entire novel trying to figure out for myself how and how, why she would have done that. So, um, yeah, I find, I find fact a huge stimulus to fiction. Great. Thank you. So our next question um, start, kind of really starts out kind of as a comment, but this book is so visceral. I felt as if I could smell the blood, hear the noises of the ward. How did you research the various aspects of this story? Like the flu, the childbirth, the hospital practices of the era. It's incredible. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I had great sources. I, I read books, uh, you know, so often I think readers think that you're there in the archives looking at, at you know, manuscripts that no one's ever seen, not at all. You're almost always drawing on the work of other historians. So for instance, I read two separate books about the flu in Ireland. I read books about the flu um, in America. Say so the character of Bridie is really inspired by one particular volunteer in, in a book about the flu in America. A volunteer who you know caught the flu herself and said that this, but even so this was the best week she'd ever had. You know, that, that feeling of being thrillingly needed, thrillingly useful. So a lot of nurses looked back on this time <clears throat> with frankly nostalgia, you know, much as a lot of men, um, you know, missed the war when it was over. Um, so yes, I read a lot about the flu and um, with a lot of these medical questions, I approached it two ways. I looked at sources from the time, 
But then knowing that there are many inaccuracies in there or things they didn't understand at the time, for instance, they didn't even know what a virus was in those days. They kept looking for a bacteria and couldn't see one um, because viruses are much tinier. But then I would also look at, say, modern websites, the Mayo Clinic, that kind of thing, to try and figure out what was going on in the case of each of these patients on, you know, the different complications of their birth process and their flu. You know, sometimes I was like, oh, my God, does that one have high blood pressure or low? And what effect would that have, you know? Um, and I tried to use my own confusion because I remember for one particular patient I was researching, I realized that, you know, for one of the things that was wrong with her, you should lift her legs. And for one of the things that was wrong with her, you should lift her head. <laughs> I could imagine Julia like, oh, God, where do I put this woman? Um, so I, I was quite a stretch for me to try and understand all this medical stuff. And again, with the childbirth stuff, I, I read, you know, books um, that were used to teach nurses and midwives in the 1910s, which were typically by doctors and had a very stern tone, like, you know, don't make any decisions, right? You just need to understand this stuff enough to run and get the doctor, but don't do anything yourself. You know, they were clearly terrified of nurses or midwives having any autonomy. Um, but I, then I would also look at modern websites about things like how to try and turn a baby if it's, say, a stargazer facing the wrong way. So, um, and I read some great books by, by modern doctors about the kind of atmosphere in hospitals and the, the kind of dark humor and, you know, the ways they have of survive, surviving a really grueling shift. So I just sort of came at it from every possible angle I could, you know. But I have to say the medical stuff was a bit of a stretch for me. Um, sometimes I was just as my mother would say, put to the pin of my collar, trying to understand, um, yeah, the medical stuff. Oh yeah, I, I can only imagine. So our next question from the audience says, I absolutely love this book and have a Ken on hold to read next. And the one question I have is the same sex relationships. They seem to be a side note. I would like to have seen them take a more prevalent part since they didn't, perhaps they should have been left out. What are your thoughts? I don't think I agree that that say same-sex relationships have to either be right in the middle or not at all. I think maybe when I started writing in the in the late 80s, it would have seemed like a book was either say a lesbian novel, like you know, right in the forefront, or not at all. And but that's because there was such a pressure to sort of, you know, announce this new taboo subject. Um, and um, there was such a pressure to produce sort of coming out narratives. Whereas I think nowadays there's there's a lot less pressure to 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 you know if there's going to be same sex love in a story at all to suddenly make that the, the big coming out moment. In a way, I I think it's more radical to to look at the lives of three incredibly busy women over three days. And I mean, for instance, Dr. Lynn in the book, she lived with a woman all her life. Uh, this woman, Madeline French Mullen, funded Dr. Lynn's own flu clinic. They were this amazing duo, sort of united in revolutionary politics, and then they founded. A children's hospital together um, and you know Dr. Lynn is literally busy at the hospital for three days so there's not much room for me to explore her home life there so I literally just showed her putting a little silver photograph of herself and the woman she lives with on on her temporary desk you know and it, it comes up a couple of lines for Dr. Lynn um, so so yeah I suppose I feel that at this point you know I've, I've had lesbian plots in quite a lot of my novels um, and not in others. And I feel that it comes up when it's relevant and I try and, you know, treat it as, as honestly and beautifully as any other relationship, but it doesn't have to move right to the center and be announced with drums, you know? Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, another question is, I'm currently listening to the audiobook version, which is wonderfully done. How did you choose Emma Luce to read your book? I'm so glad you asked because, um, it was in March, right? So they were very, very suddenly deciding to bring it out. And, you know, they didn't skimp on anything. They just had to work really fast. So they said to me, because of lockdown, we can't find an Irish actress. Can we use an American actress with a good brogue? And I was like, no, I'm sorry, you can't. <laughs> this book has to be absolutely authentic. That's why, in a way, I could have said a pandemic novel anywhere because it happened everywhere. But I, I went for Dublin because I knew I could get the voice right. And I needed the performance to be just an impeccable accent. So I said to my publishers, hang on, I will email everyone I know in the arts in Ireland. I'm sure we'll find somebody who's got a home studio, you know, because I knew that, you know, some actors are beginning to set up home studios for themselves with, you know, um, padding in their wardrobes, that kind of thing. 
So um, I, I, I knew Emma because her brother Andrew was a producer on Room, and, but also quite a few other actors. I sort of collected names. So my publishers tried out quite a few of them. But, but Emma's, Emma's voice and interpretation, we all loved the best. So I think how they managed it was in, in late March, she went into a studio on her own and there was a producer in London talking to her down the line in Dublin. And then the whole thing was being recorded for my publishers in America. And I was so glad that they took the trouble because she did it impeccably and she immediately won an award for that. Yeah, I was thrilled with that. That's wonderful, That's amazing. All right, well, this, this next one's a pretty long question. So I'm gonna make sure I get it right. It says, um, I appreciate a kind of anti-clericalism and critique of Catholic exhortations that women prove that they appreciate their husbands by giving them 12 children. The reluctance of um, Father Xavier to allow Julia Power to adopt the orphan child, and finally the irony of Sister Luke, Luke the physician, acting in such a critical and judgmental way toward Bridie. Was this version of feminism, as I interpret the anti-clericalism of the work, prevalent among progressive Irish women, especially the Protestant ones? It's, yeah, it's interesting because, um, you know, Julia's Catholic and goes to Mass, but I suppose she's working in a profession where, you know, a lot, an awful lot of nurses were nuns. And so she would constantly be kind of slightly butting up against them because there was a general assumption that nuns made the best nurses, that they were just saintly and noble people by definition, you know? So I think if you were an, a lay woman, a nurse, you'd always be feeling slightly like, I can't seem to get to the top of this job because you know the nuns are running things. Um, and in particular, I, I wanted to show, you know, a, a range of, of of nun and priest characters. For instance, Father Xavier is a perfectly nice and gentle priest. Um, so I don't want to show them all as villains, but I think as the as the people who ran these institutions, you know, the, the mother and baby homes, the Magdalen hospitals, the orphanages, they had a lot invested in, in that system, that, you know, kind of pipeline of, of so-called welfare institutions, um, which they literally got a lot of money from the state to run and often ran with, with enormously cruel results. So yeah, you know, it, it's kind of hard to avoid a certain anti-clerical slant if you're looking at Irish history, it sort of naturally comes up. Um, but I always try and show too the, the huge strength that faith gave people too. I mean, you know, at, at moments in, in, in the birth process, individual women in this book are crying out their prayers and Julia is too, as soon as a woman dies, she always says a prayer in her head. Um, and similarly say in my novel, The Wonder, where this little girl is, is inspired by religion to stop eating, you could say that's a very anti-clerical novel, but I also show that, you know, her Catholic faith gives this little girl, you know, something to absolutely lift her out of her condition of just being some peasant nobody. You know, it's a kind of like this grand spiritual drama. You know, she gets to be the most important person in the world just by praying a lot and, and saying she doesn't need food anymore. So I suppose they're trying to show, you know, that the, the, that Catholicism offered these people so much, you know, it wasn't just some trick, you know, it had, it had wonderfully good sides and genuine charitable impulses, but many of the institutions went very wrong. Yeah. Thank you. So um, the next question, um, and you've talked a little bit about Dr. Lynn. Um, so this um, question says, Dr. Lynn is amazing. How did she figure in your early on conception of the story? Yeah, well, I really, I thought of her as just background. I mean, I, I knew I, I would have to have some doctors coming in and out, and there are a few doctors in the story, but then I thought it would be interesting to have a woman doctor, given that they were unusual, and that, you know, Dr. Lynn herself um, did specialize in midwifery, among other things, um, so I thought it would be interesting to have this kind of, you know, all-female space, um, and as I say, she began to kind of, you know, loom larger than I meant her to, you know, her, her politics started rubbing off on Julia, for instance, I'd really tried to keep Julia sort of neutral. And, um, you know, there's a moment when she says to Dr. Lynn, I'm too busy for politics. And in a way with the first draft, I had, I had kept Julia too busy for politics. But I remember my, my American agent saying to me, you know, you have to have Julia um, take some kind of stand here. She can't stay neutral on the subject of who's to run her country. You know, she, she has to be in some way affected by Dr. Lynn because, you know, the stakes are too high. We care so much about these women um, that in a way we can't be neutral about the politics. And um, she also said, you know, 
in, in, in the cultural moment of Trump, no, nobody's neutral about politics. You know, this is an era of, of painful divisions. And in a way, you, you can't stay out of politics. So I rewrote that scene and I had um, Dr. Lynn say to Julia, you know, everything's politics, the politics and everything. Um, so, yeah, Dr. Lynn became a very interesting character. And I also liked what she did to the structure of the book, because then it's not just Julia meets Bridie. It's, it's three different women at very different points on the kind of ladder, the hospital hierarchies. You have Dr. Lynn, who she's a doctor, so you know her word is to be respected. But on the other hand, people are throwing her dirty looks because she's an ex-prisoner. She's, she's you know, politically involved. Um, she, and she's literally on the run from police during the time that this novel is set um, in that they were arresting all the members of Sinn Féin. So she gets you know, hauled off by police at a certain point in the book. Um, so she's a funny mixture of high status and, and low, you know, the, the kind of scary outsider. Um, and then Julia is highly competent in running this ward, but, you know, she's, she's not a senior nurse or anything. She, she has a feeling of winginess, doesn't know what she's doing. And then Bridie is an absolute nobody, but has a lot of sort of natural gifts. And Bridie is just as crucial to keeping these women happy and comfortable and safe as any of the others are. I suppose I was trying to suggest that healthcare is at its best a kind of a a strong web, you know, that catches us and, you know, the, the cleaner and the, you know, the, the porter, all these people are, are necessary to looking after you just as much as the, the specialists. Well, thank you. You know, we just have a few more minutes and I know there's a number of questions. So we'll, we'll get through a couple more and we'll apologize if, if we don't. I'm trying to give shorter questions. answers. I'm dreadfully Gabby. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's a, um, so the next question is, have you started um, your next book and how do you get your ideas? Yeah, I, I was on one novel and then got distracted by COVID and jumped to another and then jumped to a musical. So like many writers, I'm a bit distracted this year, but I am writing a lot. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm collaborating on a musical with a composer, which is a brand new thing for me. And it might seem a little rash to be writing a musical at the point where who knows when theaters will be open again, but it's a sort of promise to myself, you know, someday, someday theater will be back. And so I'm writing a, a big ambitious musical and I'm so enjoying it. That's the main thing these days. Wonderful, thank you. And then we have a question about where you're at right now. Somebody wondered if you were in Ireland. No, I'm in London, Ontario, where I've been based since 1998. Um, and once you've had kids in a country, it does feel very much like you've put roots down there. But I go back to Ireland a lot. Um, until COVID, I would say I was back every few months and I've, you know, I made room the film with uh, Irish, an Irish company and I'm with the same company. I'm making a film of The Wonder. I've had plays there, like the, the first room production. So I go back and, and try and have some kind of ongoing uh, collaboration there on a regular basis because, you know, that way it's, it's much less sad to be in it to be an immigrant if you keep those strong ties to home. Right, right, thank you. I think we have one last question here. Um, so this one says, I read and enjoyed both Room and The Pull of the Stars. Which of your novels would you recommend I read next? And are you, and then they also asked about if you're writing a new book. Yeah. But, um, so maybe what would you recommend hmm. next? Well, if they like those two, those, those are both pretty meaty and dramatic. So I'm gonna suggest The Wonder from 2016, this one about the, the little girl who's fasting. Um, whereas, you know, anyone who found The Full of the Stars too horrifying, I would probably recommend my last one, Akin, which is much more gentle and contemporary and um, kind of uh, chatty. Some of my novels have more blood in them than others, put it that way. My 13-year-old my is just horrified by my subject. She's like, where do you get these ideas? Why do you write them? <laughs> oh, well, you have to follow your path. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so very much. Um, one last comment I wanted to um, I wanted to say is, you know, throughout the book, it really, you know, is the focus. I mean, we see the mothers, but the focus really is these caretakers, you know, Dr. Lynn, Julia, Bridie. And I think really now, you know, so much, um, you know, our, our caretakers, our medical teams, you know, and, and all of our countries through COVID have really just been heroic. And so I really loved the focus that you took on on the caregivers and the medical profession, because I think the longer things go on with COVID, we sometimes forget, you know, we're forgetting what the healthcare workers are, are doing. Oh, you're right, we had a few months of passionate clapping for them, but we forget that their work goes on and, you know, the risks they run go on. Yeah, yeah. Right, so that was really fascinating spotlight, but this was such a perfect um, choice for all our, our All Pikes Peak reads. And so we thank you so much for being here. We thank the wonderful audience. You had great questions and we appreciate your 
your attendance and your interest. And, and thank you again, Emma. It was lovely. This was great meeting fun. You and having you here this evening. Good night, all. This was lovely. Stay well. Thank you. you too. Bye bye. Thank you.